to, we have investigated how surplus value emanates from capital. We have now to see how capital arises from surplus value, employing surplus value as capital, reconverting it into capital is called accumulation of capital. In this chapter, Marx is continuing his analysis from the previous chapter, but now instead of assuming that capitalists consume all the surplus value for themselves, he is looking at what actually happens when they instead invest some of that surplus value back into production to grow their business and accumulate further capital, and how this process actually becomes a necessity. In one word, surplus value is convertible into capital solely because the surplus product, whose value it is, already comprises the material elements of new capital. For accumulation to take place, production must be expanded. The capitalist must now use some of their profits to invest back into production. This means that they now must purchase both an extra amount of the means of production and an extra amount of labour power from the market. However, this means that both of those things have to already be available on the market for them to purchase, which means they must have previously been produced already. For example, if our hat-making capitalist needs to purchase a new, increased amount of cotton thread than previously before to grow their business, then previously the capitalist that produces cotton thread must have already expanded and grown their business in order to have a larger amount of cotton thread to sell. And for that to have happened, the capitalist that produces raw cotton must have previously expanded their business in order to have a larger supply to sell in the first place. Expanded production somewhere then always requires previous expanded production elsewhere, or a necessity for accumulation is previous accumulation. We must also take into account that an expanded use of extra means of production means that either the current amount of workers will be required to work more intensely, or an extra amount of labour power will be required to work on them. Our capitalist, who is buying an increased amounts of cotton thread to expand their production, will also now need extra workers to work on the new larger amounts of cotton thread than they previously did before. Meaning, extra workers must have previously been created and made available on the market to purchase, prior to our capitalist expansion. While this is something we'll deal with more over the next few chapters, we can see that from what we know so far, capitalism has already solved this problem. We already know that the value of the wages that the workers receive, representative of the value of their labour power, is determined not only to maintain their labour power, but also to reproduce its numbers. The ownership of past unpaid labour is thenceforth the sole condition for the appropriation of living unpaid labour on a constantly increasing scale. The more the capitalist has accumulated, the more he is able to accumulate. If we remember back to the beginning of the previous chapter on simple reproduction, in our view of a yearly cycle, we saw that every year capitalism must reproduce all the means of production and labour power that it used up in the year to make sure that it can produce the same amount again in the next year. With accumulation, however, we can see that capitalism must not just reproduce what it used up in a year to ensure it can continue at the same level in the next, but it must also produce an extra amount every year to ensure that it can also expand in the next. And simply put, the more capitalism accumulated in the previous cycle, the more it can accumulate in the current one. Therefore, however much the capitalist mode of appropriation may seem to fly in the face of the original laws of commodity production, it nevertheless arises not from a violation, but on the contrary, from the application of these laws. This also means that the mass of wealth that labour power creates 
that becomes separated and alienated from them via the wage form, which we discussed in the previous chapter, also faces the workers on an ever increasing scale. We can see that a continual growing mass of wealth separated from the workers who produce it is a natural consequence of capitalism and not some sort of mistake. It's a function of the system itself, a feature, not a bug. Throughout the entire book so far, we've seen and assumed that the extraction of surplus value from the labourers was the end goal of production. However, now that we are viewing everything as a repeating cycle, we can actually see that this extraction of surplus value is instead just the means to expand production. The reinvestment of it back into the business to grow production and accumulate more capital instead becomes the end goal. It's the valorization of value, the extraction of surplus value being reinvested back into production to then extract even more surplus value to again be reinvested back into production in an ever-expanding feedback loop is value's ability to define and magnify its own worth. In simple reproduction from the previous chapter, we could have described the total production process as an infinitely rotating circle. With accumulation and expanded production, however, it instead becomes an infinitely growing spiral. It goes without saying that political economy has not failed to exploit, in the interest of the capitalist class, Adam Smith's doctrine that the whole of that part of the net product which is transformed into capital is consumed by the working class. In this short section, Marx is mainly responding to classical political economists stemming from the writings of Adam Smith, who argue that the growing mass of production discussed in the previous section is natural because, ultimately, everything produced is consumed by the workers themselves. Marx's point is that workers may indeed be consuming all capital that's created. However, they're only doing so to reproduce themselves and their conditions as workers under capitalism. The consuming of the actual labour power is done by the capitalists, not the workers. The actual decisions of what is or isn't produced and the general path or direction of society's production is completely separate from the workers themselves, whether they consume all that is produced or not. We will also see in the next chapter that really it is only the productive labourers who are consuming the means of production and not the unproductive. However, the majority of the technical details in this section, including things such as constant or fixed capital and variable or circulating capital, is dealt with by Marx in much more detail throughout all of Volume 2 of Capital.